uh, hi, and I'd like to uh, welcome you to an interview with Peter Sir, this year's winner of the Lawrence O'Shaughnessy Award for Poetry, given by the Center for Irish Studies at the University of St. Thomas. Uh, Peter Sir is the director of the Irish Writers' Center in Dublin, and uh, his volume of poetry that we're going to talk about today is The Ledger of Fruitful Exchange, which was published in 1995 by the Gallery Press in Ireland. Uh, welcome, uh, Mr. Sir. Um, I'd like to just start to start talking to you a little bit about uh, your background and how you first heard the heard the siren song of the muse that mm. started you off on the journey into poetry. Yeah, well, it's it's a, it's a long time ago. I mean, it's, it's in some ways it's more difficult for me to remember a time when I wasn't trying to write poems. Um, I can remember, you know, as a, as, a, as a teenager and even even younger than that, um, trying to write things. I can remember being struck as if by a bolt of lightning at the age of about 17 by actually it was a review of the American poet um, Robert Lowell and just, just by a, a couple of lines, it was a review written by I think Seamus Heaney for the Irish Times and he, right. just, he just mentioned a couple of lines from, from one of his, of, of his poems and I, I remember being just really kind of taken and, and, and driven by that and I kind of knew, you know the way you, you know things straight away, right. and I kind of knew at that point that this was something I was going to, to want to, to pursue. Almost like the way Kavanagh, Patrick Kavanagh said that you, you begin to dabble in something and you discover that it, it becomes a life. I mean, that, that's in a sense the way it's been um, from sort of playing with it and, 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 and becoming interested in it. It, it. it becomes a kind of obsession, right. really. You can't, can't let it alone. You have uh, you have been influenced by more than just Irish writers. You've been influenced by American writers, many many different many different sources. Yeah, I, I, I mean, all different kinds of writers. Um, I'm as liable to be interested in or influenced by um, an anthology of Japanese poetry, or, or you know, an Ameri I mean, some of the poets I really admire um, greatly are happen to be American. Um, it's the obvious kind of names like. Um, um, like Lowell and Berryman and um, Charles Wright, contemporary poet, and Wallace Stevens and Crane and so on. I, I, I could go on listing names. Right. Um, also, there would be it Italian, French, kind of German poets that, I, that I'd be interested in, um, and that would have maybe had have had some sort of influence as as as, as well. You are uh, you are also the uh, mm. director of the Irish Writers Centre, and so mm. you're sort of the, the traffic cop for, as we say, the traffic cop for Irish literature in the heart of Dublin. I'm not even sure if it's as glamorous as being a, a traffic. No. <laughs> it's even less glamorous. Yeah, yeah. It's sort of the traffic warden for Irish literature. Um, can you can you uh, sort of uh, explore some of your your duties and activities as director? Um, I can. Yeah. Well, I run the the Irish Writers Centre. Um, it's it's a place which promotes interest in um, in writing and writers and it's also a, a sort of resource center it's a place where writers um, come for information or to use um, computers or, or whatever we uh, we have basically a year-round program of readings lectures workshops book launches performances of one kind or another right. um, with a, a program of workshops um, again that goes on throughout the year and we also organize events around the, the country so pretty much anything and everything to do with contemporary writing, we're involved with in in, in some way, shape, or form. So it's um, quite a quite a role to play in in the supposedly very literary city of Dublin. As I've been told, it's very literary. Um, uh, let, let's take a look at uh, some of your some of your poetry that you have in the, the Ledger of Fruitful Exchange. I wonder if you could talk the, the sort of the opening poem, the poem that sort of sort of strikes uh, the reader's eye again. You talk about that thunderbolt that, that, that struck you in, in hearing uh, about Lowell. It's, it's certainly, mm. There's certainly an element of lightning in this poem here. It's, it's called the Cures. I wonder if you could just discuss uh, its, its background, its inspiration, its, its genesis. Um, sure, well, I, it started really when I became interested in the, the music and then the writings of the medieval German abbess. Um, Hildegard of, of being right, a now, right, right. now kind of international right. me mega kind of pop star. Um, <laughs> right. But I became interested in, uh, first of all I was drawn to her music and then and then I became interested in, in some of her writings and started reading books about her. Right. And I was particularly interested in she, she kept um, books of, of cures. Right. Um, and it just seemed, reading these as if 
she had a, a cure for every disease known to humankind, right. and I just I became fascinated by this idea. Right. Um, first of all, of the notion of the of the book of of cures, um, and then the fact that everything everything was somehow curable. Everything right. everything in life that could possibly befall you, right. there was an exact cure there right. um, waiting. So, in a sense, I mean, I really I kind of it's a found poem in that what the, what the poem does is. Um, it, it kind of rearranges and slightly invents um, actual cures of, of, of Hildegard's. Um, so some of, them are, some of them are genuine, some of them are spurious, they're all kind of mixed up there, right. to, there together. It builds, it has, a certain, um, it has a certain, it has that mystic drumbeat to it, and it's building, it builds that sort of a, a great conclusion. Yeah, yeah. And there's a wonderful image of the night, which I see as a very, a very strong metaphor in your, in your writing, sort of that, because you talk about, the, we, we'll talk later about, about the idea of the journey, but it's almost from the night into, into light or the night into a dawn, an uncertainty in the, that's hidden in the dawn. But perhaps you'd like to t just read for us Cures, your first poem. In the Certainly. Cures. For jaundice, a stunned bat worn around the waist until it dies. For epilepsy, glowworms in a cloth, loosely tied, laid on the stomach, for deafness, a lion's ear, for melancholy, an ostrich, for desire, a sparrowhawk, camphor, calandria. For drunkenness, a little bitch half drowned, its head rubbed against the veins. For dimness of the eyes, a salve of apple leaves. For dropsy, the spindle tree, for migraine, aloe, myrrh, poppy oil and flower. For barrenness, hazelnuts, convolvulus, water pepper. For boldness, bear's grease, ashes of wheat and straw. For the heart, stork spill, nutmeg. For the devil, mulled copper. For vexation, compress of aspen. For guitar, tansy. For worms, cherry seeds. For fever, tormental, honey. Rowans, plums, sapphire, emerald in wine. Topaz in a ring to show poison. For fleas, dried earth. For hatred, a doe. For silence, the sea. For pride, alabaster, oak, leopard. The wrecked sun creeping to its hut. The night, Hugging and hoarding its secret alphabets. Wonderful. And again, that last line: "The night hugging and hoarding its secret alphabets," is is another is another uh, element in your work, which is um, we talked a little bit how Irish writers or Irish writing is sometimes bedeviled by an urge or an attraction to mythology or or a myth. Uh, there's a famous line of Patrick Kavanagh castigating the Irish novelist Flann O'Brien for lacking a myth. I wonder if, uh, considering sort of the druidic sort of overtones or the, the mystic uh, element mm -hmm. in this, what, what's your own opinion of, of the role of myth in contemporary Irish, uh, for contemporary Irish writers? I, I don't know. I have to say, I have to, to admit that I've, uh, I've always been sort of fairly sceptical about the notion that a writer needs some sort of solving or solving myth before, before he or she can call themselves a writer. Right. And I'm not quite sure where it comes from. Sometimes I think it comes from a certain kind of self, to be honest, self-aggrandizement, or right. um, that 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 the, the writer is this kind of druidic, vatic sort of figure for a lot of people that takes on enormous kind of burdens on behalf of the society. Right. Um, and in in that sort of vision of the writer, then it seems appropriate that the writer has a particular sort of body of of myth or prophecy that it is their burden to to dispense. But I, I don't know. I've always, I've always really kind of worked, as I suspect a lot of writers, on a much more, um, I don't know, instinctual level, on a kind of gut level, and because I have a fairly skeptical disposition in some ways, I'm, I'm not, right, right, right. I'm not, uh, um, the greatest kind of host for, for, for myths. Okay. Um, it's not, it's not to say that I don't also admire. Um, the kind of surprise and magic that the poetry is 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 about, but that I don't see it as a kind of quasi um, religion um, or a, a sort of slightly suspect form of spirituality. I don't know. Right. right so you have a. a I think we 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 sort of uh, decided we had to label it anti myth as the sort of predominant <laughs> re, uh, resistant uh, uh, sort of a, a, a you have a sort of a vaccine to myth in working through your your poetry, um, which I think is very, a very powerful form of myth itself, even though I'm, I'm sure I'm getting into trouble with you for saying that. But the anti-myth is, is, uh, is particularly that last line, the, the night, let me just refer to the night hugging and hoarding its secret alphabets, is the idea of, of uh, the opaqueness of life and the opaqueness of reality is very, is very strong in, in your work. Um, yeah. But 
But a, a sort of a, a dominant metaphor that uh, is very attractive to, to me is the idea of, uh, of exile, of journey, of travel. Of, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Perhaps we could look at another poem of yours, and I, think it's, I believe it's called The Key, which, which sort of takes you, takes you away from home, and this kind of explores this whole idea of, of the fragmentation of, of contemporary life, whether it has an Irish accent or not, but uh, mm -hmm. the whole, the mm -hmm. whole sense of, uh, of being away. Perhaps uh, you want to talk a little bit about the background of The Key? Well, the, the, the key comes from a, a group of kind of related poems, all of which um, in some way rework the notion of um, the prodigal son, actually, and the return of the, particularly the, the idea of the return of the prodigal, right. um, the, the, the prodigal having, having kind of departed from the, the bosom of the family. Um, and I'm just kind of interested in, I've always been interested in that story, what's always taken me is just the, the moment of, of return and the kind of problematics of, of return and the sort of the, the subsequent life of, of the prodigal. Um, so I think this, this series, and in, in fact a, a good lot of the book in, in general, just plays around the notion of home. What exactly, what exactly do we mean um, by, by home? How is it defined and how are we ever still enough in the one place long enough to, to have a sense of of, of, of spiritual as well as um, kind of literal and physical right. home. Um, so that's really what, I suppose the key is, is another way of, 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 of saying that is uh, having found the kind of key that solves the mystery of, of home. Of course, it, that doesn't happen, but that's, 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 that's where it's coming from, I think. Yeah. And if sort of, again, it connects with your, your skepticism towards myth, uh, myth and or sort of one simple story in which she kind of contains the writer. Uh, perhaps you'd like to read us a sure, section from sure, the key. Sure. Above all, let no one come home having found a spot in an atlas, shouldering the hill that will squat there forever, always the same colour and the same time, endless grey dawn before rage, disappointment, confusion, fear, each in its turn puts out the thin, expected flower. Something after all for standing still, not an ode, admittedly, but the song the sensible son sings at the party in his friend's house, out of his mind, griping but basically happy. Life, not what you make of it, the bright, explosive gesture, the seizing of fate where it hurts, and off on the first bus out. But the frame that shows instead, dust settling on the other option, the short trek back to the wooden shack, the sun-dazed farm, the lit city, the album of what you know sung repeatedly into the dawn. When I get back, I almost break down the door before finding the key. It's always like this, always perversely missing, always mysteriously there. I was also thinking of that of the, the son who didn't go away, what it must have felt like. Right. You know, um, you do everything, you, you obey, you obey uh, the rules, you live, you try, you try to live the good life. Right. Um, and then you watch your father um, Roast the fatted calf for your kind of right. errant, truant right. um, brother. Right, and I've been through that myself, <laughs> believe me, more than once. Uh, there's sort of the four virtues, if I can say, I don't know if it's virtues, it's too strong, but it's with the, that line, rage, disappointment, confusion, and fear, sort of like the four horsemen of your poetry, I think, uh, that, that sort of that, that pop up and stamp their feet through the, through your verse. So maybe that's too strong of a, a statement, but I certainly see that, that, that sense of, of uh, Skepticism, let's say, skepticism for simplicity. What puts out the thin expected flower? I really like that. Uh, if we turn the page, I don't know if it just there's an even clearer um, sort of a statement of that that whole perplexity, uh, more connected to the Irish experience, though I think of the Irish experience of this sort of fragmentation of family and of life, mm. is that your poem a lesson, which is very uh, sweetly simple. I think perhaps you'd like to talk about the, the origin of the lesson. Um, I think, uh, as you say, I mean, it, comes, it comes out of what is a very common experience um, for, for Irish people, that is the, the experience of a certain kind of um, fragmentation because uh, so many people leave. Um, and then that creates all kinds of dynamics. I think in, within a family, I think, it, for instance, the expectation that the, the family unit will fragment at an early stage creates um, a certain kind of dynamic within the family before it happens. Right. Um, a certain kind of emotional blockage um, as, as well because uh, you know mothers, fathers, brothers have to resign themselves to the fact that, that, that um, the people they're now looking at across the table are, are going to be in 
um, you know, South Africa or, or, or Ohio um, or, or wherever within, within a year or two. So right. a it lot can of be a blessing. It so can be. It can be. It can be. Where are you going? It can be a great thing. Another airplane. Another flight out soon. <laughs> So I mean, a lot of this was a lot of this was written when I was away. I mean, exile is probably too strong a word for what I was doing. I mean, and in fact, the time I was doing it, the government were trying to convince us that we weren't exiles; we were commuters. Oh, that's right. Um, we were the commuter commuter um, Brian Lennon, generation. Wasn't it? Yeah, we couldn't all live on this small right. island. That's right. um, Brian Lennon said. Um, so, in any case, it it just came out of, out out of partly out of that experience and just um, again playing with the idea of. Um, family and um, and home and, and and that kind of experience and it's it's called a lesson and it's very it's very short. Okay. Um, you say there is a language in which the word for family is also the word for departure. Handing across books, tapes, the world's thinnest dictionary, learn it. You say. I like that line, learn it. And the reason I like that line, learn it, is there's a great ironic sort of a sort of dark, uh, maybe it's an Irish humorous sort of quality in the sense that the world's thinnest dictionary, dictionary involves the concept of departure and going away and the sense that it ha there's an answer in that. And I think that, that a lot of what I see in your work is that is being faithful to non-answers. So sometimes it, the things are, things are open-ended, things are, things are not, cannot be simply sort of summarized or summed up. Um, and it's, it's, this kind of brings me to another, to, to the key, another key element in your poetry, which is uh, going to the trade songs, the sort of the stories of, of medieval Jews. Um, there was a sort of an inspiration, I believe, for your for your poem, page thirty-four, uh, which brings us to the title of the piece, "The Ledger of Fruitful Exchange," which is a wonderfully evocative, perplexing title. Perhaps you'd like to talk a little bit about trade songs. Well, again, this was just. It was, Pure accident in a way, and, and that's one of the things I actually like uh, and value most about about poetry um, is, is the kind of hospitality to accident and, and surprise. Right. I mean, again, I go back and I think of what the American critic and poet Randall Jarrell said: a poet was he said, somebody who's, who, after a lifetime of standing out in the rain, is lucky enough to be hit by lightning three or four times. Right. And uh, and I love that notion <laughs> of, 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 right. of poetry. Uh, you know, that kind of luck, lucky strike. But this in this particular case, I was just wandering around a second-hand bookshop in Milan, in Italy, where I was living at the time, and came across this battered old paperback about the kind of history of, of Jewish travelers in, in medieval Europe. And I've always been interested in, I don't know why exactly, but accounts of travel. Um, travel writing of any kind, whether even if it's just um, a map or a guidebook, I just I'm constantly kind of drawn towards right. a, a, any kind of forms of, of travel writing. Um, and so I was I was drawn to this and and, and read it, um, and and the poems really came came out of that. Um, and again, it was simply the experience of it. I mean, it can be any kind of. It doesn't really necessarily matter, particularly that they're. It's about Jewish travelers. It could be any any kind of nomadic experience or any kind of. Um, experience which has uncertainty and restlessness um, maybe at, at the heart of it um, and so that's it, it's out of this that, that, that the the, um, the title of the book came again kind of ac accidentally um, I'll just be the first the opening kind of little because these are just kind of um, nuggets of, of things without um, without any real end or, um, or conclusion. Right. Um, the nuggets without a mind. No, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Taking from the West, eunuchs, female slaves, boys, also brocade, castor, martin, swords. Coming back with camphor, cinnamon, aloes. This is the book of ways and kingdoms, the ledger of fruitful exchange. Um, the, I call the book a ledger, kind of perversely enough, I suppose, the, le the ledger of fruitful exchange. Partly because, um, I mean, a lot of the, I mean, a lot of the book is actually a kind, a kind of long, sustained love poem. I don't know why. I'm also very suspicious of the word um, love poem because um, I think it's it's more of a kind of desire poem, maybe more than wouldn't a love one, but. I was thinking of that as a kind of a, b b a basic exchange and, and metaphors of travel and currency and exchange um, kept coming into play. 
and so uh, one part of me was thinking of, of, of that also as, as, as a kind of, you know, one kind of fruitful um, exchange. Um, this, this, rem this suggests to me that your, the conundrum of your, of your identity as an, as an Irish writer with, a, with a European obsessions or a European writer landed mm -hmm. with Irish obsessions or uh, some, somewhat both at the same time. Uh, I wonder if you could talk about your accusations of Europeanness that have been thrown at you. Well, I think I think Irish people are strange about Europe because I think uh, the, f the the very fact I mean Ireland is part of Europe has always been it is there ge geographically a part of Europe, but people in Ireland still make the distinction and they talk about going to to Europe, travelling right. to Europe as if we right. were we were somehow not part of it. Right. And of course, psychologically, um, we we are not part of it. I mean, historically, I mean you don't you don't have to go back you know if you go back any 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 length of time in, in Irish history. Um, you discover all kinds of, of links, you know, economic and, and religious and so on, all kinds of links um, between this small island and the, and the, and the greater continent. Um, so I, 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 I've always felt, partly because I've lived um, outside of Ireland, I lived in um, what we call Europe um, for, for a, a good few years, and I always just felt very drawn to it. I always felt, because maybe Ireland is a small country, um, just curious, you know, always curious curiosity about other places, other languages, other cultures. Um, to you know, look just to look at other other things and hear other sounds. Um, so I've always been very drawn to it, and and um, I, I think I think I still am, even though I, I don't. I live now in in, in Dublin. Um, I'm still as interested in. I think you're always interested in. Um, Elsewhere, I mean, it's the old Irish saying of you know being being Irish for the or not the thing of the you know faraway cows having long horns. Right. Um, whatever is is somewhere else is is elsewhere is is attractive. For me, that's a huge, huge um, kind of um, powerful um, force, um, and it's kind of perverse as well. You always you always want what you haven't got at this particular time, or you always want to be where you are not right. now. Um, right. There's sort of a, the rambling Irishman sort of a element. Yeah, um, yeah. The, I was wondering, there's a long section, speaking of wandering and desire for what is, what is always mm -hmm. put out, there's a long section of in, in, this, in the Ledger of Fru Fruitful Exchange called the Journal, which um, the jacket of your book uh, sort of deviously describes as the history of a love affair, which suggests that it, it is, it is a, a closed book in its own way, should we say? It wasn't really written. Yeah, I don't know why that was. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's because people. I think it's because people are embarrassed, to be quite honest, about um, about love poetry um, in in the late twentieth century. And, right. and and I think there's a you know. So if if it can be disguised or made more um, respectable by being put into into the past or, right. or into, <laughs> into, into, into any other framework right. um, than sort of present desire, then it's better. Right. Um, but it's simply, it was just simply a poem which was written at a particular period in, in, in my life about a particular um, person and a particular kind of situation. And it, it, it just, it was really, that's why it, it was called a journal, and that's all it was. Um, it, it was simply a way of recording that as it was happening and after it happened and so on. Um, so it, it, was, it was simply a way of, of, of giving a name or words to, to something important that was happening at, right. at, at the time. There was a, there was a section that, that caught my eye on page 60, I think it is, uh, which you, in which you try and you deal directly. I mean, you talk about the, the, the squeamishness people feel towards love poetry, but here you deal directly um, with, the, with that theme of love. Um, I wonder if you could read us a little section there. Um, this is just one short section um, from it. How could I not celebrate it? Days on a single hair, a month on your laughter. How the dolphin plunges for sheer joy into the light. How the green lakes turn to rapids. How some gentle creature lingers all day in the corner of your mouth. Love, wait for me where the first crystals shatter and the darkness grows unsure. Let us still be there when summer comes and the white nights forgive the winter. Let the God who comes between us tumble from his chair into an everlasting stupor. 
I wanted to ask you about that line. I suppose it's not fair to ask you about that line, but I was going to ask you about that line. Like the God who comes between us. Um, is there any particular God or any um, particular idea behind that line? No, it's just, it's just um, whenever I, uh, some, some annoyance, some, some obstacle, some irritation, uh, when I want to dignify it, I call it a God. <laughs> and, 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 and imagine I'm being bothered by it. By, by, by him or her, but there is um, there is a sort of fortu fortunate for uh, there is a there is a, an idea in this poetry of water, and particularly in, in journal, it the image returns. I think we're it's a sort of serendipity, yeah. right? And as we are interviewing each other, but uh, <laughs> there's the idea of the religion of water, and it's kind of a, a caustic, humorous comment. I believe your yeah. your lover makes. Um, I wonder if you could talk about rain. Irish writing. Well, I think I, I, think <laughs> I would love to. I think I would love to do an anthology sometime, um, a, a, a kind of anthology of Irish right. writing and right. rain, yeah. and it would just be an anthology of kind of wet, you know, kind of rain-soaked um, poetry and prose and and, and and drama. And again, you know, it just it, this, it, it simply happened that when this kind of longish poem was was being written, um, there was a lot of kind of walking, a, a kind of expeditions to the country and walking around the hills of of, of Wicklow. Um, and for whatever reason, whatever, whatever God, again, right. um, was observing us, we simply had to step outside the door when the heavens opened, and so we spent a lot of time um, being soaked by, by the rain of, kind of Dublin and Wicklow. Um, but I also love, I mean, I have to say, I do, I, do, um, I, love, um, I love the light that comes with it. Right. Um, and I love the smell of it, and I love the uh, I love the moment it stops, um, and you get this extraordinary kind of um, light, and what Kavanagh calls the, the kind of the dreeping hedges. The dreeping hedges. Right. Um, so I think it is, you know, okay, you, you you pay the penalty of getting wet, but you you, you are rewarded as well. Okay. Well, it's been my it's been my very great uh, pleasure and an honor to talk today with the winner, this 1999 winner of the Lawrence O'Shaughnessy uh, uh, Poetry Award, uh, Peter Sir. Thank you very much. Thank you.